Good afternoon, or wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit today. Welcome to the demonstration corner. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the TPS-2 uh, and some of the temperature capabilities. But before we do, uh, it's pretty customary here to just show you a little bit about all the instruments that are set up in our demonstration corner. They're uh, conveniently located on this board, our, our laboratory instruments and our portable series, but we can do a, a quick little summary uh, with the camera moving. This is our THW L1 for measuring liquids and paste for thermal conductivity, diffusivity, and specific heat. The ultimate range options on the L1 are cryogenic up to 300 Celsius. Uh, options on the pressure are 20 bar and 35 bar, which allow you to test past boiling points. This follows ASTM 7896. The Transient plane source or TPS2 follows ISO 22007 2. This measures thermal conductivity, diffusivity, and specific heat for solids, paste, and powders over a wide temperature range. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today as a part two to the live demonstration done yesterday. The MP1 is our flagship transient method, it combines both transient hot wire and transient plane source with a whole new set of capabilities and advancements, uh, both for multiple sensors, multiple temperature options, uh, really quite advanced if you're in the market for transient methods. This is the industry leader. Um, this is our guarded heat flow meter following ASTM E1530. It's a GHFM01. This is for measuring thermal resistance and thermal conductivity. It's guarded, so it allows for complex structures and layers where we want to ensure one-dimensional heat flow. That, that guard oven moves up, and we have a delta T across the sample, and it gives us one-dimensional heat flow. This is from minus 20 to 300 Celsius. And then lastly, our heat flow meter, HFM100, which is what is showing. That's for measuring insulation and construction materials, across a wide range of temperatures. We have a couple different sizes of that. That one there is sample sizes of 300 millimeters by 300 millimeters by up to 100 millimeters thick. And actually next week, we'll be discussing both of these instruments uh, on two different days, the guarded heat flow meter and the heat flow meter. So coming back to the TPS-2, this is our, our entry, our basic TPS-2. It has two Thermal conductivity ranges up to 100 watts per Kelvin and up to 500 watts per Kelvin. We did a full live demo, so if you want to see that, uh, that was done yesterday. You can review that. But here we're going to talk a little bit about the temperature options. So before I do show you our, our new uh, thermoelectric dry bath, which goes from 0 to 100 C, uh, we can talk about how the other temperature options. Um, this is the upgrade to the included adapter. So with the upgraded peak adapter on the room temperature sample holder that comes with the device, this unit can go from minus 75 to 300 Celsius. Uh, that, the sample holder that comes with the device, it allows for sample sizes of up to approximately 100 millimeters by 100 millimeters by 50 millimeters thick. So it does have advantages on sample size flexibility. We offer an arrangement of ovens that allow you to pass this cable through the oven and your sensor is connected in much the same way as the room temperature one, just with a much wider temperature range. This is the high temperature portion of the cable. This stays inside the oven, of course, and so we can re reach multiple, uh, multiple options on measuring high temperature. So I thought I'd just share that. We didn't bring the oven over, which maybe we'll, uh, we will another day. <clears throat> the ovens we offer are fully programmable, so they, they set and automatically go to temperatures and allow for full control by the software. That is the same as the thermoelectric dry bath option that we're going to talk about today. It's fully controlled, recognized, and automated through the software. This device is from 0 to 100 Celsius. So it, you can almost think of it as two parts. The dry bath itself, which provides the cooling and heating, and then the sample holder. You'll see in the software that it recognizes it as two parts. We can, we can remove the thermoelectric dry bath and use a heat exchanger for achieving lower temperatures. The 
lower temperatures options on this are based off what chiller you use, what chiller circulator you use. But we'll be focusing on this today. So I'm going to switch cameras and we'll show disassembly, sample setup, and a quick setup in the software of how to make a room temperature, rather a temperature measurement inside the dry bath. But that, it would essentially be many of the same steps if you were measuring at uh, much larger temperature ranges. So I'm going to switch cameras. So here you have a top view. This is an insulated lid. So we can remove this. You can see it's insulated and it allows for the cutaway for what is our sample holder. We're going to remove the top portion of the sample holder. And this is where we set our sensor in place and set our samples. I should say that there are a number of different types of sample holders that are rather uh, cells that you can add to the uh, dry bath. One is a powder cell, a, a PCM cell, slab components. There's a number of, of optional uh, cells that allow you to expand the capability of this. So first, for setting up the sensor, we're going to back off the, the sensor contacts. We're simply going to slide the sensors contacts down. So all of our devices, all of our adapters for running temperature, whether they're at room temperature or at temperature for different ranges, we don't need cables on any of our sensors. All of our sensors come without cables. They don't need them because everything is built. All the sensor connections are built into all of our devices. So by applying uh, a little bit of pressure, we get equal distribution of force. We can turn these down. Just finger tight is all you need. And then if we were going to do asymmetric setup, so again, you can do asymmetric setup in this, uh, this physical setup and on any other device we have by including uh, insulation. So the sandwich would be insulation, sensor, sample. So in this case, if you buy a high temperature device, you get two pieces of uh, calcium silicate, which are the temperature range for these are up to several hundred degrees. So it's certainly more than we need for this, this uh, simple temperature option that goes up to 100 degrees. If you want uh, the floor of this goes up and down to account for different sample heights. So if you have a very thin material, you can raise the floor and that allows you to test a wide variety of thicknesses. So the maximum dimensions for this setup, for the dry bath setup is 40 millimeters diameter which is what this sample is, by 20 millimeters in height per half. So per sample half. So we're going to do a symmetric setup. If you was asymmetric, you would place your known material on the bottom and you would place your unknown on top. That would be a single-sided setup. But we're going to do a symmetric setup where this, there's a sample on top and bottom. So there's our bottom half. We're going to place our top half. And then we're going to introduce and use the included uh, protection metal. And then we're going to put in reverse, put our cover back on, affix the sides. And apply just a little bit of pressure to seat this, the samples around the sensor. And then put our lid back on. So this is already sitting at uh, room temperature. Uh, rather 23 degrees, the front of the controller, if you could see it, it's 23 degrees. And that information is fed to the software. So that's complete. We'll move to the software and do a, a, a few steps of the measurement to show you how the software interacts. So here's our, uh, again, the software is set up in two applications. First application is data acquisition, so it controls the unit, controls the, con uh, the controller, and anything that's temperature plugged into it. This is the data acquisition software. And the, th the thermal analysis software is where we use to review our data in full calculation capability. So here, we can enter our name. We can pick the method we're going to measure. So we're going to use 3D disk source. We're going to measure symmetric. Isotropic, these are some of the other capabilities. If you would like to review of these, uh, if you look at previous live demos, we talk about these uh, a lot more. We're going to tell where we want or inform the unit where, uh, where we want the data saved. So here's a previous experiment. I could append this or I could just uh, add another, another location for the new data. 
So we're going to do symmetric, isotropic, semi-infinite body, and not thin film. It auto, the software auto detects what is plugged into it. If you want to review that, you can always go to the home, and it shows you that right now the controllers detect it, the dry bath is connected, and the high temperature sample holder that's sitting on top of it is connected. So we're going to select the dry bath as the temperature option. And the port we're going to use is one. Again, on the TPS2, we only have one port. On the MP1, which is our multi-port device, we have four ports. Here we can name our sample. So this is stainless steel 304. Our sample height is 20 millimeters. I've previously measured this. Our radius is 20 millimeters. We have an auto, uh, auto, rec uh, auto suggestion of sensor size, ideally uh, suited because of the included dimensions you enter. So it suggests 33171. Had I not known what sensor to use, I could have done this step first, then set the sensor up. The sensor we used was 33171, or 6.4 millimeters radius. We're going to check the resistance. So that just ensures that we have electrical connection with the sensor. <clears throat> or if we have the wrong sensor connected, it'll give us a red uh, warning saying something is wrong uh, like that. Let's, uh, let's go back and make sure we have set up. I'm just going to reseat the sensor. Just to make sure. So we can check that again. Good. So all I did, uh, you can't see in the camera angle, but I went back and just res uh, reset the sensor. So live demo, it's kind of neat to see that step. That saves you the time of setting, setting up a whole experiment and then starting your temperature measurements and then walking away if your sensor is not properly connected. So we didn't plan on that, but it does demonstrate the convenience of that check sensor step. So um, as always, we can use the... Uh, ITPS to run um, the parameters, which it's, uh, if you want to see that in previous, previous live demos, you can. The ITPS automatically, automatically suggests the parameters for the measurements. We won't bother with that today. The temperature is automatic. It's taken from the controller itself. The parameters are, are suggested for the measurement are uh, 500 milliwatts, but of course you have a wide range of powers you can use. <clears throat> and the, the suggested time is five seconds, and that is the ideal time to keep the heat we introduce in the sen uh, sample inside, within the dimensions of the sample. We could, run a, we could run a quick transient, but let's go ahead and set up a schedule based off of this confirmed experiment. So here, <clears throat> excuse me, we could run a single test, which would be go to 50 degrees, and make the measurement, but more convenient if you have temperature would be to set up a range of temperatures. So let's go from 25 to 100 in 25 degree increments. We'll use one power of 500 milliwatts in five seconds. So we're going to run five measurements with a 10 minute delay between each. So it auto builds our experiment schedule. When we click start, it will automatically start the process of changing the temperature on the schedule, on the device rather, and start the uh, experimental process. So if, uh, if we waited around long enough, we would see each stage of this experiment. You can see in the previous to the demonstration, I ran a quick measurement at near 20 degrees. This is what a complete schedule would look like. This is only one temperature, of course, but you can see the individual, in the event log, you can see the individual experiments and the quality indicators, as well as the residuals. And so inside the data acquisition, you can get quite a bit of information. But we designed the thermal analysis application to allow us to have much more power to review data, analyze it, and export it. So although we can see data here, we can review the data a lot more conveniently inside the thermal analysis application. So here is previously run data, uh, stainless steel 304 measured from 25 degrees, you can see this column is Celsius, up to 100 degrees. We can review the tabled data, 
We can also review the residual patterns, which look very good. They should be random, which means they're free of contact resistance and free of reflections due to hitting the boundaries of the sample. But we also can look at the thermal conductivity with temperature. So here you can see the change in thermal conductivity with temperature up to 100 degrees. So each, each of these are five experiments, I believe. Uh, you can see the, the, um, the change in thermal conductivity with temperature for stainless steel 304. Drift, so in, ad, in, in advance of every measurement, it automatically detects the drift. So when you're running temperature measurements, there's a, automatically a two-stage process that if we go back to the um, data acquisition side and look at where the first experiment is at, we have not reached stability for 25. So the room's sitting at 23. Uh, this will have to heat up for two degrees and become stable. We will monitor the stability of temperature at the uh, furnace level or the controller level, and then we monitor the stability of the temperature at the sensor level. So it's a two-stage uh, confirmation of isothermal conditions process. That, that ensures we have our temperature, no matter what the temperature is, that it's isothermal. That's really important. This is confirmation of that. So in advance of every measurement, a drift monitoring is done to ensure that our temperature is stable. If we had a decaying uh, shape, then that means your sample is still cooling. And the reverse of that, if you had a warming shape, that means your sample is still heating. So that, that could come from if you wait, if, you, uh, if the unit is not, if the temperature unit or your room rather even is not stable, you would see those shapes. And it's a warning to say, hey, uh, allow more time in between measurements of the same sample or allow more time for your temperature to become stable. And then as always, we can see our temperature rise versus time, which is our raw data. And we can review our data individually. So we can see uh, the thermal conductivity, the penetration depth, uh, as well as a contact correction for each, or we can review them as a single set of one temperature, or all of them. So here you can see all of them. So all of this can be exported to Excel. There's a full analysis capability inside of this. We can do multiple calculations for the same set of data. Instead of trying to memorize each data set, we can add a new calculation and have uh, a variety of calculations all uh, quickly accessible and reviewable. All this can be exported to Excel. We can see all the results by generate full report. And you would click desktop, save it, and then you could review it there. And we'll probably do that as, a, as another live demonstration, which would be how to take advantage of the full thermal analysis application and, and really get the most out of it. I think that's it. Uh, we wanted to just give a, a quick demonstration on the thermal electric dry bath. Thanks for joining. And if you have any questions, you can write us, info at thermtest.com, and we're happy.